I am John Ataguba, originating from a very rural part of Nigeria. I have lived in abject poverty and have experienced the real meaning of deprivation, hunger, and ill health. As a child, I would ask with curiosity why some people have while others don't. For me, everything on earth was meant to be shared. I often accompanied my parents to our farm where we grew a few crops for subsistence. Land belonged to everyone to cultivate. I was very fortunate to attend school because my father, who is educated, and my mother, who was not privileged to attend any formal school, knew the importance of education. Even with this support, I attended the schools that my parents could afford. In fact, my senior secondary school certificate was obtained from a Quintal II school. That is, a school that is not for the wealthy. My government did not provide me with a scholarship. I was soon to suffer some of the consequences of attending such schools. I could not get into a good university for about four years after completing high school. These painfully lost years were sufficient for me to have obtained my bachelor's and honors degrees. I persevered in seeking entrance into one of the top most universities in Nigeria. Indeed, it paid off. Again, my parents had to become poorer to afford me the opportunity. Poor nutrition, no savings, etc. This opportunity was for me one of the greatest that I cherish immensely. I graduated with the highest honor, setting new records that earned me honor. This was a breakout, and for the first time, I won a scholarship to do my master's in Africa's topmost university. Something that I have never dreamt of as an adolescent. I was going to do health economics to address the challenges in my country and in Africa at large. This passion was so alive in me. Now, why this story? I lost my mother halfway through my master's program, at least due to failures in the Nigerian health system. The underlying value was at least that if you cannot afford it, you do not deserve it. I was deeply saddened. I was also soon to lose my mother-in-law, similarly, related to a health provider's poor sense of judgment. In all this, I picked up a strong passion for addressing health inequalities and inequities poverty and ill health, and for ensuring that there was a commitment to equitable financing of health services in Nigeria and later on in South Africa. The center of my interests has been on vulnerable populations that include women and children. Living and working in South Africa I was faced with some scary maternal and child health statistics the country records a high maternal mortality ratio in the region. For every 300th child that is born in South Africa, at least one mother dies. This is eight times over and above the Millennium Development Goals target set for the country. In essence, no fewer than 260 mothers, children, and baby and babies die every day in South Africa. These figures are puzzling for such a relatively wealthy country as South Africa. So some of the issues facing Nigeria, my first home, are also very apparent in South Africa. Interestingly, South Africa after the end of apartheid in 1994 
has made considerable efforts, such as providing free public health services for pregnant women and children under six years. The question then is, why do we have these horrible statistics? Perhaps again, this has a lot to do with the high level of inequality in the country. The bottom 20% of South Africans share about 2% of incomes compared to over 70% shared by the top 20% of South Africans. Maybe the issue is beyond just making services free. Maybe we need to understand other determinants of health in order to address the problem. The South African health system is segmented. The private sector serves a small minority of the population, which are the rich. The public sector is so under-resourced and serves over 80% of the population that are depended totally on it. Because I'm so much interested in resources for health, including health financing, with the general support we got from IDRC and other funders, my colleagues and I found that private health insurance, which finances mainly private sector services, is unaffordable. On top of this, we found that people living in a household headed by a woman are very less likely to be enrolled in a private health insurance. Some of these have contributed immensely to the recent government's commitment to establishing a national health insurance in the country. In fact, there is a real desire within the country to redress some of the major health challenges including those that affect women and children. The Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Motswaledi, Mot 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 is so determined in this regard. This is one of the highest levels of policy impact that my research engagements have afforded me, and for which I am very grateful to my funders and colleagues. Recently, I have been privileged to be appointed by the Honorable Minister of Health in South Africa to contribute to the design of the national health insurance. This for me is a great recognition of the work that my colleagues and I have done in South Africa on health inequalities and health financing. While things are still in their early stages, I'm very hopeful that there will be a significant impact with the continued support of funders like the IDRC, which will lead to substantial empowerment of women and other vulnerable groups, so that they will be able to assess needed health services and reduce, amongst other things, maternal deaths in South Africa. While I acknowledge that ensuring good health involves more than the health sector, I aspire for all countries, especially those in Sub-Saharan Africa, to achieve universal health coverage. Thus, everyone, including men, women, and children, will be able to use health services that they need without any barriers. So that health, which is often synonymous to wealth, will not be the sole prerogative of the wealthy and that all people will have the opportunity to flourish.